Chapter 2 Riddles from the Past It all started for me when I was a young child and I saw a picture of the Great Pyramid. I was told right then that no one really knew how it was done and in that moment I was hooked on our mysterious past. From that moment, all interest in comic books was gone and for hours I would pore over my mother's encyclopedias. I couldn't understand much of the text, but the pictures of dinosaurs and ancient and mysterious megalithic structures absorbed me totally. Where do they come from I wondered. Does mankind really have an unknown history that has been lost or forgotten? Could there really have been an advanced civilization in far ancient times, before our recorded history? The question and debates on the issue have raged for years. When asked, most scholars will tell you that it's a nice idea, but fanciful at best and there is really no hard evidence to show that such a civilization ever really existed. However, many others will argue that there is actually a significant body of evidence that does exist that simply cannot be explained away. So what are the realities? What kind of evidence are we talking about? Just a bunch of weird cave paintings and esoteric theories by strange people, or is there something more tangible? To be perfectly honest about it, anthropological evidence, however convincing, is always circumstantial, while legends and myths without evidence are questionable at best and naturally open to individual interpretation, so we must look for further corroboration. When we do, we find that there is in fact, a large and ever-growing body of hard physical evidence that goes a long way towards disproving what we have been led to believe. This evidence tells us that either the history we are taught of the Earth's is wrong, or the history we are taught of mankind's development is wrong, for both. The reality of this is fast becoming far too great to deny and still more evidence to reinforce the conclusion is being found ever more frequently. So the obvious conclusion that we're faced with here is that the academic community is either completely stupid which is doubtful, or quite simply not telling us the truth. Maybe they're just waiting for the right moment, but before we try and find where the answers to our puzzle may lie, let's investigate what kind of body of evidence for an ancient civilization of advanced technology actually does exist, in what form it takes and whether we are presented with anything that truly cannot be explained. And as you will see, the evidence that our entire history is wrong is indeed quite vast and comes in a great variety of forms. But to start with we can examine some of the tantalizing Noah parts mentioned in the previous chapter, and, according to our orthodox history, these objects really are extremely out of place. The word must also be said here on the methods used to date many of these artifacts. In objects that contain organic material, the radiocarbon dating method was used. While other inorganic objects were dated by dating the rock strata they were found in and other standard geological methods. Both these dating techniques are subject to variation depending on past events that may have occurred at the sites being dated and this will be discussed later but for now, consider some of these enigmas. The Pyre Rays map of 1513 in 1929 There was an amazing map discovered in the Imperial Archives at Constantinople that had been sitting virtually unexamined, four years. The map fig, which had been drawn in 1513 by a Turkish admiral named Pyre Race, showed North America, South America, Greenland and Antarctica. However what is so perplexing about this map is that Antarctica had not been discovered in 1513. Antarctica was not located until 1820 and America had only been discovered in 1492 the mere 21 years prior to the map's creation and yet it is mapped quite accurately. Remarkably, the map also depicts several land masses bearing their correct longitudes even though longitude itself was not discovered until the late 1700s either. Rage had been a famous Turkish admiral of the 16th century. He had a passion for maps, he loved cartography and was a highly experienced and respected mariner. In his day, he was considered to be an expert on all Mediterranean lands and coastlines and also held high in the favors of the Turkish court. Such a noble status enabled him to enjoy privileged access to the imperial library at Constantinople and he spent much of his spare time there. In his notes Race said that he had based his map on several much older maps he had seen at the library, including one that Columbus is reported to have viewed prior to his voyage to the Americas. The map in question was said to have been captured from the Spaniards in a naval engagement and later given to the Admiral by a Spanish prisoner who had apparently sailed on three of Columbus's New World voyages. 
Many scholars have indeed suspected that Columbus was in possession of a map and already knew of the existence of America before embarking on his famous voyage of discovery. Grace also wrote a well-known Turkish book on sailing called Kita Baby Bari in which he gives detailed and accurate descriptions of the coastlines, harbors, bays, currents, shallows and straits of the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. He was beheaded by the Turkish court in 1554 or 1555 for reasons now unknown. In case you can't see it, that's the top piece of Africa on the top right of the map and the tip of South America reaching out to it from the left side of the map, running up through the Gulf of Mexico and up to Nth America. The tip of Antarctica can be seen sticking up on the bottom right. Another interesting point to this map is the strange layout of the South American continent which looks sort of stretched out of shape. However, viewing the sphere of Earth from space accurately produces this type of view. Funny that. The Aranti used by news map of 1531 The Aranti used by news map fig was found in 1960 by Charles Hapgood and it too apparently shows the continent of Antarctica along with the accurate outlines of Antarctic rivers that are now covered by thick glaciers. The map was found in the Library of Congress in Washington D.C. where it had been sitting unstudied for a great many years. In the map the continent and coastline is shown to be ice free and, like the Pyre Ray map, it too shows an accurate depiction of the Ross Sea which today is totally hidden beneath the floating ice shelf several hundred meters thick. Studies of actual core samples taken from the Antarctic ice shelf have also clearly revealed numerous layers of strata in the ice showing that the area has indeed gone through several periods of dramatic environmental change. Some sedimentary deposits that were found in the samples were from sea water that had flowed into the area and were even actually datable. The tests show that the sediments were deposited sometime around 4,000 years ago which indicates that the Ross Sea would have had to have been flowing and free from ice at the time for the deposits to have occurred. The Bocci map of 1737 Philip Bocci was a French geographer of the 18th century who also drew a map that clearly shows Antarctica except that Bocci's map shows Antarctica to separate land masses, with detailed shorelines fig. For many years the map was generally considered to be wrong because when Antarctica was discovered it actually looked nothing what Bocci had drawn. Then in 1958 a seismic survey of Antarctica was carried out which surprisingly showed that Antarctica was indeed two archipelago islands covered by a thick layer of ice that made it appear as only one land mass and not only that, but that the general topography of the lands beneath. The ice matches the drawings on the Bocce map in every detail. So how on earth this can be in any way possible? This map means that Bocci was in possession of a correct map showing Antarctica 100 years before it was discovered and not only that, but without any ice on it. Antarctica has not been in an ice-free condition for a minimum of at least 10,000 years and many scientists believe that the period of time to be more like several million years. The Franco Rosselli map of 1508 Franco Rosselli was a renowned Florentine cartographer of the 15th century who created a relatively small but richly illustrated copper plate engraving, hand-colored on vellum, measuring just 6 x 11 inches fig. He piece is now kept in the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. At the time Rosselli created the map, cartography was still a relatively new and experimental art which makes the revelations in his world map even more amazing. The map's depiction of Antarctica is a work of great accuracy and even names the area quite specifically as Antarcticus. The details on the Rosselli map are extremely well painted and as with the previous maps, geographical features such as the Ross Sea and Wilkes Land are particularly easy to identify on it. Again, what is so perplexing about this extraordinary map is the year it was painted in 1508. According to our history this is a full three and a half centuries before Antarctica was discovered. And yet here again we have Antarctica depicted accurately on a 15th century Florentine map.
the Mercator map of 1538 and even yet another intriguing map is one drawn in 1538 by Mercator, another highly respected cartographer who lived in the 16th century. His works are quite famous and you can still buy Mercator Atlas in shops today. Mercator was known to periodically update his works and produce a new, more definitive world atlas as more shores became charted and more accurate charts become available to him. In doing such an update, his 1538 world map fig was replaced by a new one in 1569. However we now know that not only was his 1538 map far more accurate than the latter one but what proved to be even more amazing was that it also contained correct measurements of longitude. To put all this mention of longitude into some sort of perspective for you, longitude is the distance in degrees east or west of the prime meridian. Due to the Earth's rotation, it is far harder to calculate longitude than it is latitude, which can be measured by using the stars or the sun for observation. To calculate longitude, requires an equation of distance equals speed x time and, most importantly, an accurate clock. Discovering longitude was once described as greatest of all naval problems and in the 1700s an actual board of longitude was set up in England to solve the issue. In 1714, Sir Isaac Newton appeared before the board and explained that the real problem was that a watch required for such accuracy has not yet been invented. The Queen then offered a price of £20,000 to any man who might build such a device and finally, in 1761, a man by the name of Harrison claimed the prize and put forth his prototype chronometer which then ushered in a new era of sea travel for the world. Fig. During the 19th century maps then began being updated with the correct degrees of longitude. However Mercator's map of 1538 was marked with correct longitude a full 223 years before it was discovered. Where was he able to gain that information from? It is obvious that Mercator himself had no real knowledge of longitude at the time and must have borrowed or been given the information from another source because he then updated his subsequent maps incorrectly with what was considered to be more recent and therefore, supposedly more reliable information. These maps constitute some extremely significant evidence indeed, for if ancient man had never circumnavigated the globe or possessed any knowledge of longitude then how can any of these maps exist?